Hello and thank you for joining us on the first edition of Journalist Hangout. This week, I'm Ayodili Uzubaku. Today on the program, Oshomole renews hostilities with Governor Obaseki, insists Edo Assembly Speaker must resign. Nigeria community raises alarm over fresh xenophobic violence as more protests against foreigners rock South Africa. And later on the show, Samson Siasia cries out for help as kidnappers refuse to release his mother despite collecting 1.5 million naira ransom. I'll be hanging out with Mayor Akikbelu, Ghani Kaede Balogun. So if you're ready, let the hangout start now. Thank you for joining us. We have been told several times that old habits die hard. So vested interests which drive political aspirations cannot be easily discarded. After a seeming lull in hostilities between the forces loyal to Governor Godwin Opaseki and the national chairman of the All Progressive Congress, APC, Adams Oshomole, it appears the crisis between the two political gladiators has been reignited. Speaking in Abuja, Oshomole stirred the honest nest when he vowed not to recognize Frank Okie as the speaker of the Edo State House of Assembly. He insisted that he should resign since the process that produced him as a speaker was flawed. Let's hear from Adams Oshomole. So I think what is at stake is not about me or Obaseki. It's about what is right, what is wrong, what is moral, what is immoral, what is lawful, what is unlawful. I have seen self-appointed lawyers who seek to defend this, but I'm not worried. After all, lawyers defend even arm robbers. For those who think it is between me and him, seeing us in photograph means issues are settled. But those in the don't know that the issues are not between me and him. We cannot run away from calling an all-inclusive meeting of all APC leaders, which is well captured in our APC constitution, what we call the CACOS, plus any other leader of note who we know has voice and has electoral value. Adam Soshomole, <laughs> Mio, I don't know, <laughs> said, any leaders of APC has voice and the caveat, electoral value. Yeah, I think he's trying, <laughs> he was trying to throw stones to the former chairman oh my. of the party. <laughs> he was trying to say that he doesn't have electoral value because um, sincerely, the, the, the former chairman, now, time and time again, I find it difficult to deliver his, um, his area. And, um, but um, I, 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 I can understand where Oshimola is coming from. What he's trying to say is that he has been, he has been, he has been, he has been put on the defensive, because initially, he was on the offensive, and the National Assembly seems to be going along with him, to say, look, you have to reconstitute the the Assembly, Absolutely. you have to change, you have to follow due process, that the election of the of the Speaker is flawed and they didn't follow due process, but because eminent personalities have intervened. Oshomole cannot, he has been persuaded to cease fire. So he, he has to go along with, with what Obaseke is trying to do, is trying to say, look, we, we, are, we are okay, there is no problem. Because if there is status quo ante, um, it, it favors the governor. Because already he has, his, he has his speaker in place. And what Oshomole wants is to have the speaker. Because um, in the course of doing the election, more members of the assembly are with Oshomole than the governor. But the governor believes that it would not be wise for him to allow somebody that is not in his camp to be the speaker. That is the bone of contention. And because eminent personalities have intervened, Oshomole finds it difficult to go on the offensive. There seems to be a ceasefire, as it were. So what he's trying to the yes, the what he's trying to say is to say, look, yes, there is approachment. Yes, we were sent together, but that's not the issue. The issue is that we have to come together and negotiate. Apparently, that's what he's saying, because right now, the governor's person is in place. Chikebi, hmm. now, looking at the status quo now, the House of Representatives, the Senate, that's the National Assembly, they've given the governor 
you know, the marching order that he should, you know, uh, issue a fresh proclamation. Yeah. Now, the governor has gone to court. So, so we are, we, we are waiting. But with the photo ops that I saw recently, and even um, the last Ramadan, um, Obaseki visited Yamo, um, Oshomole's country home, and you know we saw the pictures and everything smiling together. I thought that okay, maybe they've started um, this truce. But with what Oshomole is saying now, we know it was just for the photographs. Yeah, because the the challenge in Edo State right now is between the governor and the majority of party members who felt that they've been left out in the constitution of this government, as it were. And this, of course, is a major issue even for Oshemole to throw on that carpet. Fine, the government has come into place, but what people are saying is that, fine, let Oshemole's camp stay back. Let the governor's camp stay back. Let's have a neutral person to become speaker. But the governor is not very comfortable is it with that. possible to have a neutral person because, within, uh, mm, what what normally within, you have, you, you have, within APC. Uh, you have some, within APC. Is it that you are here or there? They will have somebody who is a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. I'm sure that within that somebody house. will be in that house. Both of them can agree, can work for their interests. Mm. But the governor is not about to lose the advantage he assumed that he has by keeping the speaker. But you and I know that in the Nigerian system, having the speaker is not a cycle norm that he will keep that advantage. Because just like he implemented his own at the middle of the night, nothing stops Abuja from coming in and do the same thing. Take out the speaker, all the six people. We've done it before, I think, in Nikiti. They've done it, Nikiti. They've done it in Nasarawa. They did it in Plateau. Just look for the number that you have and start a new Now you have, even as a state in the north, we have two speakers, one for the governor and one for the party. All these are not new in our balance. But my fear is this, if they do not come together on time, before the election comes, something will have to give. And it will not be palatable for the party. GKB, I've had to listen to Obaseki, Governor Obaseki, and um, the interview granted in Abuja, and while he was talking about, I'm not even a governor, that I can't, I couldn't influence appointments, I couldn't put our people there, I couldn't do this. That's, Somebody else is, has been doing that. And in reverse, this case, this particular interview, Adam Sushomale was also quoted that, look, your 20-man cabinet, that I had one commissioner, and that one commissioner was sacked after the first uh, um, reconciliatory meeting we had. Yes, you see, in, 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 when, in, when you are in quest for power, everybody trying to press their advantage. The governor may be right to some extent, but not not um, not truthful, because it is not it is not fair to say that oh I'm not even as a governor I'm helpless. He's not, because his cabinet, the other party are saying that look we are not we are not we do not consider part of your cabinet. Maybe what he could complain about is that he could say that oh federal appointments mm -hmm. I don't have inputs to federal appointment. Mm, but you see how this thing how this thing works is that if you completely dominate or decide everybody that will get an appointment at the state level. You cannot expect the chairman of the party who is, who is struggling for power with you to allow you to also pick people that will get federal appointments. It will be suicidal for Oshomole to do that because um, politics is about, it's about interest. If you, cannot, if you cannot satisfy people who are following him, they will move to the other side. That's the reality. He must have something to show his own followers. And maybe he just decided that, okay, let me, if you look at Ogun, for example, all the federal appointments right now, so far, are from, are from Amoso's camp. You understand? If Amoso doesn't get that, if all the other federal appointments comes to the Kwabi Adonis faction, then Abdulish and Ogun State, Amoso is buried. It's buried. That's how it works. So he must also struggle to make sure that he has something to offer his group. So that is what is going on in Edo. The Oshomole believes that, okay, he wants to control the governor. The governor doesn't want to be controlled. And the governor is totally in charge of his cabinet. So the only place for him to get appointment for his own followers is to go to the federal, and that's what's happening. GKB, don't they, we've had, we've worked this part 
Several times. Many times. So, if at least when you talk about the um, Oji Zokalu versus um, the Tio Oji, Tio yes. he was chief of staff, succeeded him. Mm. Talking about um, Chim Chimaruke Namani, Namani. and uh, versus uh, Sullivan Chime, yeah. uh, and, and so many of them like that. How is it that you work hard, you put somebody there, you run because I know how Shomole campaigned and everything to make sure he gets Obaseki, even at the detriment of his own deputy, the, the Odubu. And right now, it's just four years. Um, next year, they have their election, and we are talking about, from what I've been reading so far, I don't see Oshomole giving his 100% backing for uh, in, with the primaries, well, APC primaries. Ne never say never. When it comes to politics. No, why is he always? Uh, well, it's human nature. Turning out it's this human way. human nature to want to control your environment, especially when you are in office. There doesn't have to be a, a gubernatorial power. It could even be a local government. We know some local government chairman in some states that we know that have decimated their deputies so much that even ordinary councillors carry more weight in those local governments. So it's in the nature of man, really, to want to move away from whatever structures brought them into power. Don't forget that even under the principle of Michovelli, the first people that will die are those who voted for the prince. Because you have to get them out. Kingmakers must go. So it's normal that this happens. But in the case of those states, what I foresee is the fact that the only other dynamics different is that Oshimole is also the national chairman of the party. So he's not just a slighted godfather. He's also the face of the party. So not only can he hurt the governor seriously, he can even make the party uncomfortable for the man to chase him away. So in this wise, the governor must play his game in such a manner to ensure that he doesn't lose the favor of those in Abuja, as well as those at home. Because Oshimole cannot afford, as national chairman and former governor, not to do something for his own boys. Don't forget about 12 or 13 of them in the house have not been allowed to sit. They've not been paid. Because technically, they've not really, they've not reported for, yes. for work. They've not been sworn in. They've not been sworn in. Mm. So they, they cannot be paid. They cannot do all the things they expect. They were elected. Off. So that's why this problem is there. The governor doesn't want to let go of the advantage. And unless he does, Cannot get peace. Do you see? Because we are we are going we are moving closer. I think um, it's a case of between the devil and the deep blue sea, and the the, uh, the governor has to show wisdom. He has to exhibit wisdom, and what I think he should do is to sit with Oshomole, consider certain things, maybe some commissioners, consider some key posts, and insist on the speaker. I believe that the governor's camp should have the, should produce the speaker. That's what I believe. Why? Because, you see, in power, it is important for you, it will be, you, as a, as, what, as a, as a student of power, mm -hmm. you cannot, you cannot, you cannot be nice enough to give advantage to somebody you are not sure of or an opponent. He can use it against you. You understand? In, in, in quest for power, you, you don't, you, nicety is not, is not involved. What is important is interest. And when you look at your interest, is it better for you to put somebody who is an Oshomole's boy as speaker when Oshomole tomorrow can use that speaker to move against you? That would be stupid to do that. But I consider that at the same time, Oshomole is a big factor in Edo politics. Oshomole contributed greatly to Obaseki being governor. So, thinking that you can ignore him will be at his peril. Because at worst, he will lose that election. Oshomole has nothing to lose. He is the one that's going to contest election. He's the one that is even and running don't for Don't forget primary. the fact that PDP is also very strong in that particular it, state. Of course, it used, to be, it used yes. to be a PDP state. Yes, very strong. Yes, that is why, that's why I said he has to show wisdom. Because if he doesn't do that, if he decides to fight to the dead with Oshomole, he will lose that state and he will cease to be governor. So for him to be governor, he has to compromise, even in the short run. It's important for him to do that in the short run, hmm. so that he can get the second term and then rearrange the power structure. OK, I have my first caller. Issa is calling us from Edo State. Thank you for joining us, Issa. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Issa. Sir's not there. OK. 
Israel is not ready. So, so it's important for him to show wisdom because um, you have to get your second time first before you start all this, all this, because you need everybody. PDP is very strong in those states. Mm -hmm. So it's not a state, it's a state that it was a shaman that took it from PDP. Mm -hmm. So it is important to, to show wisdom. If you decide to continue to do this, because it shows that all the reproachment that we thought happened was just photo ops. Mm -hmm. Shaman have just made it note, we say it's photo ops, that we need to sit down and discuss this thing. And I agree, you know, because we discussed it once when the crisis first started. Mm -hmm. And the most that said there was that, look, they have to sit down. The power brokers in the door must sit down and share the spoils of office. They must be able to decide to say, okay, these are the things we are going to give to this group. These are the things this group will take. So that they can win that election. If not, they will lose that state. And there won't be anything to share. Okay, for the common man on the streets, we ask, okay, we're talking politics. But how has Oshomole or how has Governor Baseki benefited an average Edo man in the last four years? Uh, in their in, in Edo Central, where it comes from, there has been in and it's a violence. The governor is extremely popular. Extremely is the word. Yeah. Because on the streets of Benin, you will he know is. that they are totally with him. Mm. He has that support. But politics is a game of numbers. And like you said, PDP, the state is about 50-50, APC, PDP. Okay, yes. I think I have another Akinola from Niger State. Thank you for Hello. joining us, Aki. Hello. 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 Yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I just want to say that. Uh, pardon? Hello. Go ahead. Go yes, ahead. I want to say that uh, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to say that. I said, uh, I'm using the agenda. If I told him, I'm not easy, I have anything to do. I don't keep rushing to the court. Uh, the rushing to the court is as if he's fighting against the uh, uh, party. So, uh, with that, uh, it is better for us to keep As it has been said over there, Okay, thank you, Akinola. Thank you for your contribution. He's, he's watching the TV, so... Okay, I'm getting there. the feedback. So, the, the governor is very popular, but don't forget that he's also moving against a camp that is headed by the national chairman of the party. Like I said, that's double jeopardy. It's one thing for Shomale to be just a former governor. He'll be somewhere, sitting somewhere in the Senate. Or enjoying his life somewhere in Nigara. But he's the national chairman of the party. And he has enormous powers. So, like uh, Mayor said, two things the governor must do quickly. He has done the first one take photo ops, show people that are willing to work out this issue. Next step is to now make concessions. Call a stakeholders' conference. Make concessions. Let the full house commence work. Right now, only his own people are sitting. But let the full house come in, and then sort that problem out. Whatever, whatever you're going to concede, it's fine. But make sure everybody's carried along, because you are trying to be a governor in the 50-50 APC PDP states, and you're fighting your own party chairman. It doesn't work out that way. That'll be the extreme form of naivety. Now, we have the National Assembly, and they've, gone, they've done their findings. And if it's not because of Governor Basaki actually went to court, and um, the House of Representatives is actually empowered to yeah. actually annex the House of Assembly if the after the uh, ex the position yes, to carry out their duty the, their duty and everything uh, from what you've seen, what do you think the National Assembly will do now? Yes, they can't do anything because there is a, there is a rule in the National Assembly that um, a, when the matter is taken to court, it's sub judice and um, they cannot they cannot decide on the matter. So they've gone to court, they've given an instruction that there should be a new proclamation and that what happened was unlawful. Because you cannot just in the dead of the night install the district and put some people and then you will now sidetrack some other members and that you didn't follow due process and that they are not going to that, that will not be allowed. But like I said, they argued that it was done properly and they've gone to court. And because it, the matter is sub the, the National Assembly is not in a position to act now. That is why they have that truth. 
that's so, the same so Governor Basaki is saying that he's not going to sign a fresh commission. Yes, that is his position. What if that is a requirement for at least for a kind of uh, truce between him? Yeah, I think and I think what he's trying to say, what he's trying to say is that in issuing a new proclamation, that means there's going to be a new election. If there is a new election, the other part or the other side could win because they have more members in their own faction. Yeah. That's why he doesn't want to issue a new proclamation. But I believe that he can get around that by sitting down with that group and negotiate with them and make concessions. If you make concessions and it is acceptable to everybody involved, it doesn't need to make new proclamation. What will just happen is that the other members just walking. will come in, take their oath of office, and become members of the House. You understand what I'm saying? And this, the position of the speaker will say subsist. But he doesn't want to, to that's why he's saying he doesn't want the proclamation is that if you issue a new proclamation, that means the ones that have been done have been set aside, then the office of the speaker is vacant, and then you are going to do new election, which he doesn't want to do. Oyema is calling us from Worry. That's Delta State. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. I so much appreciate the topic for today. All right. Oshomole uh, is a political bulldozer in a dose stage. Oshomole is not someone that you can just push aside. Moreover, Oshomole is the national chairman of APC. So what I advise uh, Obaseki to do now is to come to a roundtable discussion with the national chairman. There is nothing he can do because... The treatment they gave to Ambode in Lagos will be given to him. There's nothing to say about it because Ushomole is one. Uh, we all stay in Edo State. We know what is going to happen because there is no way you can push Ushomole aside. Ushomole is a political bulldozer in Edo State. And moreover, he is the national chairman of the party. How can you do such a thing? Ushomole has been embarrassed but, uh, uh, because of this, uh, this uh, issue. So I see no reason why uh, uh, Obaseke cannot come in a roundtable discussion, and just say, Papa, I have offended you. Have mercy upon me. That is the only way out. I'm telling <laughs> I, you, my I wish is that easy. <laughs> Thank you, you, you Yoma. No, no, <laughs> this thing was just simple. No, no, but there is some sense in what you say. Oyoma spoke about the, well, yeah, it's, it's the same thing that about the saying. Saying. It's the same thing. No, it's different. OK. It's different. He's saying that the governor stands at risk of not you yes, know, uh, getting the, the, it's, the it's ticket possible. of the party. Yeah, it's possible. If it's, it yes, continues it's possible. Oh, that's very possible. Because the party will decide who the delegates are. And we know, at least experience shown, it happened in Ondo, that the national, the national party, the national, the also the, 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 the national working committee of the party can decide who the delegates are. So if they decide that, if they decide that reason that these are the delegates that are going to partake in this in these primaries, how will you win if they are not with you? That's nothing, it's, it's a two way about it. It's just the same thing like when somebody contested in Lagos. It was a stupid thing to do. Because when some people decide that these are the delegates that will vote for these primaries, it doesn't make sense to go and contest them when you know that they are in the position to determine who the delegates are. Whoever determines who the delegates are is the one in charge. He's the one in charge. He's the one in charge. So he has, to, he has to show wisdom. If not, you cannot fight, the, especially a national chairman that is not only powerful, but wants to be seen to be powerful. GKB. Huh. Yes, ultimately, I think they will come to truth. The governor is enjoying tremendous goodwill from those who are against, against Oshomole in the party, <laughs> as well as in the states. <laughs> but they do, not have, they do not have the tool to fight the man. They can fight him on the, in the media. Yeah. But when it comes to raw tax, they have to come to a truce. Hmm. Still to come, Nigerian community raises alarm over fresh xenophobic, xenophobic violence as a mob protest against foreigners rock South Africa. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Journalist Hangouts. We are reaching you live from Television Continental in, here in Lagos, Nigeria. As the diplomatic spats between Nigeria and South Africa, the two largest economies on the continent over xenophobic attacks continues. It appears the citizens of the Rainbow Nation are playing with their cards to their chest. Now, while efforts to defray the frosty relationship are ongoing, 
the Nigerian community in South Africa has raised an alarm over fresh xenophobic attacks against foreigners. The Nigerian Union in South Africa urged Nigerians residing in that country to stay away from hot spots of violence, protests in Johannesburg and other places. The Publicity Secretary of the Union, Abib Miller, who gave the advice, said it is necessary to avoid a repeat of what happened last week. Certainly, we can't afford a repeat. GKB, we're told the government, the South African government gave a kind of assurance that they will work on it. They'll work on it. Yeah. And um, the envoy that came from Nigeria yet to submit his reports. And um, sometime on Wednesday, they're saying it will start a lifting Nigerians interested. It started, I think. They started in, interested in coming back home. Where are we now? Because as at this weekend, I see saw pictures or videos, not the fake ones being circulated around, but renewed threats against foreigners in South Africa. Well, the, the people in South Africa, the people in these areas that were affected really by these attacks are the, I don't want to use the word dregs of the earth. They are the poorest of the poor. And they have nothing to lose, they're already down. So the job is on two levels. Their government must find a way to find them occupation. I don't want to use jobs, things that they can do. Because when people are economy. It's an economic problem. Normally, people in this position will look for a boogeyman. Somebody must be irresponsible. First, they will eliminate the foreigners. Then maybe they will now eliminate certain politicians. Then they will now move to the white people. It's a process of elimination. Right now, the face of poverty, the face of their problem, as far as they are concerned, are the successful foreigners in their midst. And success to them is relative to jobs that they refuse to do. Because if you remember one of those videos, they stated it clearly that these foreigners, Zimbabweans, Nigerians, are willing to take jobs for far lesser pay than they think they can survive with. But a man taking 1,000 rands a month, convert it to Naira or convert it to Zimbabwe pounds, is a lot of money to send home. You understand? So all these are issues that they must find a way around. We are just, what they might call, things that we need to do ourselves, but the main challenge is for the South African government to find a way to solve this problem quickly. Because if it balloons, they are going to also be consumed by it. I'm going to look at it from different perspectives. The first one, I'll go along with him, is economic. A lot of South Africans don't have education and they are very poor. So because they don't have education and they're very poor, and the economy of South Africa is expressing a downturn right now. So the state cannot take care of a lot of people who are poor, who are hungry and hungry. So those set of people, they just need, it's like our own, uh, the people we call um, area boys, you understand? Who, they just want an opportunity to be able to loot hmm. because they, if there is no, if they, any opportunity they have to loot, when if you look, remember the reprisals, um, protests and all that, Suri, some people went, Shambu some people Tenu. went, yeah, in Shabuta, some people went to other people's shops and they were looting the shops. That's not as they need to do because they've been waiting. They just want an opportunity to be able to loot. So there are South Africans like that because they are poor. A lot of South Africans are poor, especially in township areas. Those they are townships. very poor and they don't have education. So anytime you have opportunity to loot, they do that. The second problem has to do with our own embassy. Our embassy is not up and doing. Not only in South Africa, mostly part world. of the world. Because one, they are underfunded, and there is, there is, uh, the corruption within the Foreign Affairs Ministry is endemic. The, the, they have a scam that they do, that uh, someone told me about. From Abuja, they will send dollars to a, a particular embassy. You understand? The embassy people there will take their own court and remit the money back to those who sent it. So our embassies are underfunded, and they are not doing the needful. Because if they are doing the needful, they'll be able to come, come around, and then be this, it won't fester like this, because this is not the first time They've been, it has been happening. That's the second problem. Another problem is that there are some South Africans who are really angry with foreigners, especially Nigerians. And why they are angry is because Nigerians are involved in the drug business in South Africa. 
Mm. And not only that they are involved, they control the retail end of that business. And unfortunately, in the course of doing that, one, they try to attack themselves to be able to get spheres of influence. But in the course of selling those drugs, they introduce it to secondary schools in South Africa. Nigerians. Yes. So a lot of South Africans, a lot of South African youths, especially girls between 12 and 14, are hooked on drugs. And when they are hooked on drugs like that, they, they, they tend to move to, to prostitution. They stay in all those, like, you know, the area that you see in Ipodo, when you see girls in, like, a hostel-like place doing prostitution. So there are some group of people who believe that, oh, these people, these foreigners, Pakistanis, Nigerians, who are really involved in drug trade are messing up their people. So they are hungry. They believe that the state is not doing enough. How come Nigerians will leave Nigeria and go to South Africa and... No, 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 because you see, I explained before that in, 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 when it comes to criminality and crime, you can't stop people. There are some people who just decide that they, they, want, to, they want to be involved in crime. They are just a very minute part of Nigerians because there are a lot of Nigerians, especially in the, in the, in the, in the health sector. A lot of doctors and nurses in South and Africa are Nigerians. Universities. Yeah, and universities. A lot of lecturers are Nigerians. We are doing very well in Nigeria. It's just some small number of people who are involved in drugs. But because those drugs, the business, that nonsense business they are in, is affecting the people. Mm -hmm. they are, that, that creates such, such a bitterness towards us to say, oh, these people are destroying our case. Mm -hmm. So they wait. The government, it is very difficult for the government to control them because they want to, it's like they want to get even to say, oh, we have to take lots of time. That's why it's like a racket. The politicians don't like what is happening, but they cannot do anything about it. So they tacitly allow people to do this, to attack these people that are destroying our youth. Because they are foreigners. Yes. Mm -hmm. you can be, as if, you know, people were waiting for that thing to happen, all in the name of reprisal attack. They went to those shops and were told that most of those shops are owned by Nigerians. Yeah. And the governor of Lagos State said it yesterday that, look, like 5,000 Nigerians are going to lose their job. As a result of that yeah, attack, they yeah, are yeah, because they, they were stealing people's people's businesses yeah, yeah. and looting the the, and There are even some shop price shops, you know, some some of the centers that are scarcely populated. The one in Songo, for example, a yeah. lot of the shops are closed up. So these are excuses for somebody who is not making sales to find an excuse not to come, ask people to go. Home. Two things: if you if you are unfortunate, let me use that word, to go through Ikeja bus stop. On a Friday night, when it's raining, and you see the level of humanity waiting for the bus that will never come, hmm. and you realize that all they need is just a tinker hmm. for this thing to blow into full scale riot. Hmm. Our people are hungry. Hmm. Our people are hungry, and they are just looking for an excuse to let out that anger. And it doesn't have to be anything. It could be something as small as interracial fights between hmm. a man and a woman. Even between the bus conductor and the person from another tribe can lead to this. So this is just an opportunity for this. Stuff. Don't don't think this is the end. Hmm. Any let, let, let me just pause you there. Yeah. I have Tony. Tony is calling us from London. Thank you for joining us, Tony. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, go ahead with your contribution, um, please. Yes, I disagree with the man wearing uh, white. I don't know his name. You are allowed. Oh, please, uh, go on. Only one person cannot do a business. It's telling us that Nigerians go to uh, uh, South Africa to do drugs and all that. How, how far has drug dealing going in Nigeria? Nigeria is it a rough uh, country where drugs are you know, going on and then from there they took it to... Uh, South Africa. It's the South Africans who are doing drugs also. So when people get there somehow, they interact and things like that. That's the way I know drug goes on. It's not that our people, how many people are taking drugs in Nigeria? So it's what they do. And it's a thought of envy that they are doing all these things. Drugs goes on all over the world. So rather than Nigerians, the U.S. in Nigeria, and I don't think it's nice. And again, what I want to contribute in advance, I don't know if, yeah, of course, I, I, I don't know if I might get you again. 
Tony, thank you. Thank you what for your contribution. You uh, I think we just allow me to you clarify know. what you said. Yes, yes. 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 You see, in the drug business, yeah. there, are, there, is, there is a difference between importation of drugs into a country and retailing aspect of that drug. The retailing aspect of it is just the small, is the small fries. The brief fries, the, the real drug business is, is done by Cartels. whites and white South you Africans. They are the one, that yes, the, the retail hand. It's not all Nigerians. No, 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 no. That's, that's why I explained that. It's just, just a small fraction, fraction of Nigerians the that are involved in that drug business. But you see, we have to face the reality that that is part of the problem. Even when you see the South African stuff, they mention it. They mention it, you know, because it is a reality in South Africa, because the South Africa has drug problem. And it is very endemic in that country right now. Because you see, part of the problem is that when you are poor and then you get involved in drugs, it, and it's a very expensive habit. And they don't have this money to do that. So if they can only do crime. That's why you see them on the road. They hijack people, they, they hijack cars, they, they shoot people, they steal, they rob. Then they do prostitution because they have to sustain that habit. What is this about their women? You know, going after Nigerians, preferring no, no. Nigerians. It's, the, the difference in that one, I will tell you. The difference in that one is that it's cultural. In Nigeria, we are our culture believes that men must take care of their, their women. women. That is our culture. In mm. some clients, even Ghana, just Ghana here, they believe that when that when you when you take your girlfriend out. In some cases, both of you will share the bill. Yeah. Everybody will pay his own bill. Western world. That is their own. That is their own culture. That is their own, it's not our own belief. Mm -hmm. That's not. Mm -hmm. So when you now see Nigerians coming, there's a lady who is used to sometimes because, like I said, a lot of South Africans are not are not very educated. They are they are poor and all that. So sometimes there are ladies seems to be more comfortable than the men. So when they even go out, the ladies take care of the men. You now see a Nigerian that comes. And take care of the lady. That will pick the bill. That will pick the bill. That will go to that will go to a club and pay for everybody. That will go to a beer parlor and sub, that is the way we are. Yes, I, I agree that we are loud and sometimes it gets on the nerves of everybody. people. That's the reality. But that's who we are. So the South Africans, the South African ladies will prefer in South Africa, even in Ghana, when you date a Nigerian man, that means you're a big girl. It's a sign of a big girl. It's an achievement because the Nigerian men are in demand, in high demand. Because, like I said, they spend money, they take care of their women, and they you work know, hard. You know, mm. so that's the difference. So that is why, yes, a, a South African woman will prefer a Nigerian man because we are more, we are more loving, or we or not say loving, but we take care of our women better. More romantic. Mm. That's the word. <laughs> Going back to what we said about. The reprise are here. Yeah. And I saw those clips. Even um, some shops, I don't want to mention their names and everything. And I, and I saw it, and it was like, look, people that don't even understand what was going on in South Africa or don't know about xenophobia, but they just saw do not that care. this was an opportunity to vent our anger. We're hungry, took flat screen, took iPhones. That's sad. Took so those people that owns those companies, have nothing to do with no, governments. They just had working Nigerians absolutely. who have shops in that area. Absolutely. Because the design of the mall is peculiar. It's not the, the normal one that we have in Nigeria, where you have two-story building and everybody will be in the one staircase. Mm -hmm. A lot of young Nigerian businessmen prefer to put their business in that environment. Most of them have lost out based on this reality. So what we need to do, like I said, a lot of our people are angry and just looking for an opportunity hmm. to loot and cause mayhem. And I want to commend the police for being proactive for the Shogun Tedo thing. Yeah. Because I realized that some top officers, RRS and the rest, were there on ground, hours. And it was like a tidal wave. The people will come, they will chase them away, they will come back again more. And in fact, it took about three or four or five waves. Hmm. Before they, in fact, they had to cut off the electricity. For them to realize the police are serious. Because it was, a, it was a whole day battle huh? of throwing people, and they keep coming. So that we need to work at certain elements of what we need to do. And our people have to take this as a warning. And it's a um, reflection of the level of poverty. A level of poverty and the level of anger against the state. Because hmm. the same thing that happened to us, the same thing that is happening in South Africa, is the same thing that happened. Precisely. You know, majority of the people doing that, the looting in South Africa, are uh, just the poor people who just saw it as an opportunity for them to be able to grab what they could. And that's the same thing that happened here. But you see, 
um, we'll be able to show that at least oh, the government will be able Mayor, to show. Let's speak. Um, Rahim, Rahim is calling us from Oshun State. Thank you for joining us, Rahim. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, Rahim. Yeah, please. Tell the, please pass the message to the Nigerians in South Africa. They should be prepared to come back home because the government will not be able to stop it. The same thing happened in Ghana in 1969. When, when they drove us away from Ghana, the economy of uh, South Africa will so collapse, I'm telling you. <laughs> they don't know the, the foreigners are the people sustaining them now. It happened in Ghana. I was there. I schooled there. I finished there. It was there I schooled. Please, tell Nigerians to come back home. That country will soon collapse. It will... Well... It's not easy for Nigerians to come back. It's not, easy. it's not easy because you see there are people, there are a lot of Nigerians in South Africa that are doing very well. Extremely well. Extremely, Extremely well. well. Yeah. You see the, 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 the few people, the few people that, and even, even this, even, even this um, sort of epic attack that is going on, it's localized. It's, it's, it's localized. Even within Joburg, it's, mm. it's more small in the area. rural area. You understand? But because when you, there, are some, there are some South Africans that live in Cape Town that they will tell you that they, they don't know anything, that they will not see any people there. So people so in Pretoria, yes, that they will tell you that the place is safe. I have a friend who, who, was, who traveled to South Africa last week with, with a family. When I said, well, how can you be going to South Africa this time? He said, oh, the, the, my host said there is no problem in his own area. So it's not that every, every Nigerian will come. Those who want to come back should come back. The government should assist those who want to come back. Some are there but trapped with their passports expired. Maybe it's the best opportunity for them. Yes, they, they can come they back. They said they need travel certificates before. No, yes, the embassy can use travel certificates for them to come back. That's their job. They're supposed to that's work to the, the embassy, embassy, embassy and To be able to get travel certificates. Yeah, I don't, anybody what, that wants to come back, the government should, with which, yeah. which, has, with which they have started. Yes, anybody that wants to come back, which, but we must not compel them to come all, back home. To come back and do what? Hmm. We must not compel people to come back home. What we should just do is that we should not we should not shake our responsibilities. The government of South Africa should give adequate protection to, to everybody, everybody that everybody resides in South Africa. That is international norm. In time, in, in terms of um, government to government talks and um, the way we've handled this diplomatically, how would you assess the way um, the uh, Buhari administration has gone about this? Well, after the initial uh, uh, lukewarmness, let me use that word. I think they've risen up to the responsibility and they've followed the <laughs> diplomatic book line by line. Yeah. Everything they're supposed to do, they've done it until now. And that's what they are doing. Incidentally, we are not a superpower. We can't send a, <laughs> a ship to South Africa to show force. And we don't have a national airline to flood it like we did in Liberia, where yeah. we had issues of Syria alone, where we sent in our, our career just to show force. We are not that level anymore. Apart from that, they even do that to South Africa. They even stronger to that. Right different. now, we don't have that kind of uh, clout uh, because of distance, and of course, we don't have airline or ships of that magnitude. But yes, they've done what they are supposed to do. After the initial problem, they've upped the game and they are doing the right thing. Yeah. Yes, I want to agree with that. If they have done what they are doing now, we won't have this problem. This is started. This thing has started long time ago. But there is that lukewarm attitude, especially from our embassy and our government. And I want to tell the Nigerian government that anywhere, if the duty of government is the protection of lives and properties of its citizens, wherever they may be. So if the message must be held that Nigerians, wherever they may be, must be protected. And the government of Federal Republic of Nigeria is ready and willing to, to make sure that happens. Be now that we have done that, you see, because before, Everybody was just, everybody was oh. putting lip service to it, even the South Africans. Because like I said, they are, not, they are not happy with certain things that are happening, but because they cannot come out as a government to say certain things. You understand? But they, those who are doing it, they, they look the other way. It's just like a tacit approval of what was happening. But because our government has been very firm this time around, we are seeing, we are seeing, we are seeing changes in the attitude. But it will take a long time for us to solve that problem. Because the problem is not with the government. The problem is with the people. And those people, they are still poor. Their situation has not changed. So at every point in time, they just need a small opportunity to loot. Hmm. Hmm. Because they don't have anything. They don't have anything. That's the reality. All right. We'll, we'll, it's, it's a running story.
and um, we will throw the challenge to the Diaspora Commission. Um, Honorable Dabiri, maybe we'll speak to her later today and know what they are really putting in place for Nigerians in South Africa. Um, now, it's certainly not the best of time for former Nigerian soccer star, Samson Siasa, whose world is turning to an unpleasant circle from the kidnappers banging the phone on him after offering the pay of 500,000 Naira as ransom for the release of his abducted mother, Beauty Ogiri Siasia, to the life ban by the world governing body, that's world football governing body, FIFA, over alleged fraud and his legal battle to upturn the ban. Siasia is definitely fighting the battle of his life. Now, the kidnappers refuse to release her after collecting 1.5 million naira from the coach. Instead, instead, they release a relative and cap captured person who took the ransom to them. Hence, he's crying for help to secure the release of his um, mother 55 days after she was actually kidnapped. Pathetic this story, story. This story is very pathetic. Very pathetic because it shows the, the level of insecurity in this country. And all of us should be ashamed of what is happening. For CSI is an icon. That's an icon, yeah. It's a national icon. He served this country. He was a top player. He was a top coach. He, 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 he's one of the few people that was a coach and player of the national team. And this is not the first time the mother was kidnapped. The mother was kidnapped a few years ago. Few years ago. Ransom was paid and was released. But, and for the woman to be kidnapped and for the kidnappers to say, OK, after collecting 1.5 million, they now, uh, they now kidnap the person that brought the ransom. It shows that criminality is, hmm. the, the level of so security in this country is unbelievable. And, it, and the government should, it should be on the data of government. The, 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 the governor of Siasa State, Bayasa. which is Bayasa, should be, should, be, should be embarrassed. Everybody is looking at it as if it is Siasa's problem. It is not Siasa's problem. It is the problem yes. of the Nigerian state. In fact, because of who Siasa is, the, 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 the government of that state should have been the one to pay the ransom in the first place. And then for them to abandon him, to face this problem and keep paying kidnappers. And, no, 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 no. Know, I'm not saying government is talking to He's not, not paying. He's not, not paying. But you see, what I'm saying is that this guy is a national icon. So when he runs into a problem like that, he didn't, he didn't ask anybody to kidnap his mother. So when there is a problem that forms a, an icon like that, if, you, if an icon like Siasia can get the mother kidnapped Ordinary and then for 55 days, and then they, then you will now raise 1.5 million, pay the kidnapper, and then they will now say, okay, no, you that you brought the money, we want more money. The state should be embarrassed that that is happening. Even the Nigerian state should be embarrassed that that is happening. But now we have come to a stage where the state have left all of us to fend for ourselves. Oh, I it's like, oh, the, with the helplessness of the state when it comes to security. It shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. See, as I somebody that is known all over the world, people will laugh at us to say, well, they can kidnap the mother of somebody like Sasa, and they will be with some people, whoever they may be, for 55 days. And then they will now, the man will now say, OK, I can raise 1.5 million. They will say, OK, bring the 1.5 million. And then they will refuse to release the woman. And all of us are not embarrassed. We should be embarrassed. Well, I, I thought by now they would have, um, the Inspector General of Police would have drafted the famous IRT on this case, and the Abakayaris of this world would have left, um, led the search and you know, save us this embarrassment. Well, when it comes to perception management, we are not very proactive. Because like Mayor said, this is the best opportunity to show that we have a police force. Because the man is known all over the world, he has name recognition. And therefore, whatever we achieve by rescuing the mother is fantastic PR for the police and for the states. But by abandoning him to his fate, we are telling the world that as far as Nigeria is concerned, it's every man for himself. And the main tragedy of this is the fact that it seems so deadly occurrence. It's not, so, it, it's not really raising any outrage from anybody. Mm. It's like if it's something that is normal. It's like saying somebody went to the market and they didn't come back. And people just shrug their shoulders and life goes on. We've reached that level of pits of air and we have to start moving up. If somebody of his stature could happen to him, 
Imagine an ordinary farmer or an ordinary person, a teacher. They can keep him for two years, and nothing will happen. Because he has a voice, he has a name, and this is happening. What will happen to a man who has nobody? You just die in their captivity. And that to me is the tragedy. This has assumed a very dangerous dimension across the country. Yes. We spoke about it before yes. when yeah. the program started. And yeah. um, I think the situation is as is getting as helpless as I know we I have know. some state governors that we even or even offered to negotiate with these bandits. Yes, I, you see, um, there was a time that I, I read an article that on, um, concerning when people were criticizing Masari for negotiating with the bandits in Castina. Again, it is between the dev devil and the diplomacy. You, you, it is not good for you to negotiate with kidnappers. It's not good to pay ransom. Because by paying ransom, you are encouraging them mm. to get other people so that you can pay ransom. That is the same problem we have with Boko Haram and our girls. Because when you keep paying, when will be the last time you will pay? I understand that. But at the same time, it is the duty of government to protect its citizens. And Nigerian government is showing helplessness when it comes to security. I know they are overwhelmed, but we have to do something about it. Because the, the, the protection of life and property surpasses any other thing. That's the main job of government. That's the main job of government. That's the main job of government. That is how everybody submitted their sovereignty to the state. To say, okay, you should be able to protect us within this environment. That's why there are laws. That's why there was okay, for this thing, for this place to be habitable for everybody. These are the laid down rules and regulations and the laws of that of the land. You understand? For now, for, for the government to now look helpless, they should not do that because they are sending a wrong message. The message the government is sending is that they are helpless when it comes to protecting the citizens of this country and citizens they are on their own. They cannot be on their own. That's why there is government. So governors in each state should do more. They have security votes. They should please spend those security votes where they should spend it. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't want to pay ransom, then you must be put a security in place to make it difficult for people to kidnap. How can somebody, how can kidnappers hold somebody for 55 days and they are negotiating, they rejected 500,000, and they collected 1.5 million. And, they are, and the level of impunity and I mean, boldness is, is, is unbelievable. Razak is calling us. Thank you for joining us from Kogi State. Thank you. Yes, go ahead with your contribution, please. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in the suggestion uh, from the journalist in, in white. The, the issue is not by a state paying for something Siachia's mother to be released. The issue is the issue of security in this country. It's failure on the, on the side of the security operatives. We have people being kidnapped every day. State government cannot go out paying ransom for individuals being kidnapped. The issue definitely should be focused on the security outfits doing their job. Thank you. No, it's not, for them. You, it's not for them to pay ransom. At all. Mm. We are not saying they should pay ransom. At all. What we are saying is that they cannot leave Siasia to be on his own. It is the duty of the government to provide security for the state. And what we are saying is that the, the security architecture in Nigeria is breaking down. And that is why it is easy for kidnappers to kidnap people, and everybody just believes that it is the norm. It is not the norm. It should not be allowed. We must allow security people to do their job. They must do their job. That is the job of security people. If, for example, if the security people have been involved, when you talk about the famous IRT, there have been instances when the IRT have been sent to. Wadime was just arrested the other day. You understand? You cannot say that everybody, every Nigerian citizen, deserves the right to be protected. That's what I'm saying. So the people, the government of Bayesa and the, the Nigerian police cannot say that, oh, it is not a business that um, Siasa's mother has been kidnapped. They should not have left him to be the one that will be saying, oh, I paid 1.5 million. They've kidnapped the person that paid the ransom. They should, it, not, they should, should not create the environment. Yes. They should they provide the security yeah. to make it impossible for people to kidnap Nigerian citizens and get away with it. That's the point. That's what they're saying. It's not really about Siasa's It's person. not that Bayesa government should go and pay you a no, If you are in a state and you're and the mother of your one of our iconic names. There's your state. Freedom, it's, um, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, iconic yeah, person yeah, your state, 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 state You, as the governor of that state, should feel embarrassed okay. that we should not allow this to happen in this state. All right. Instead of leaving him to just be, be the one that will be crying to say, oh, I paid 1.5 million. They've not released my mother. They've kidnapped the person again. Okay. I will believe he should be on his own. I want to thank you, Mayor Akikwalu. Thank you for your contribution. And um, Osiare, thank you. Gane Kayori Balogun. Always a pleasure. 
And that's our offering today. Join us tomorrow for another episode of the program. You can also watch journalists hang out on our platforms showing on the screen. We're on YouTube, youtube.com slash TVC News Nigeria. Our feedback channel is journalist hangout at tvcnews.tv. I'm Ayodele Welcome. Bye for now. See you tomorrow.